Why are more banks warning investors of stocks at all-time highs? Is the Treasury set to tighten financial conditions? And are there more signs the global economy is slowing? Answer those questions and more on today's colossal show because lawyers say we cannot use the term macro. That's right. We're not allowed to use it. And no, if you're wondering, I am not done with this yet. And if you're also wondering, I did look up this, in this, all the synonyms for macro, and we are going to go through every one of them to see if some of them fit. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. Thanks for joining me today because on Monday, Bank of America came out and issued a warning to investors and say, hey, the stock market things may be getting out of control. And then what happened? The following day, Morgan Stanley comes out, issues a warning. Nomura comes out and issues a warning. And then we have Rabobank come out. And not to be outdone with itself, Bank of America is back, that's right, with another warning to say, hey, stocks may be going up, but you better be careful because this party's coming to an end. And we talked about this a bit on Monday's show because there's something that you really need to understand is they're not just throwing these warnings out to scare you and make you panic. They're really trying to communicate to you that, hey, things are getting a bit overextended. And maybe you're having too much fun at this party because that underlying problem in this market is passive investing. You know, people ask me all the time, why are the markets going up? Because passive flows are driving stocks higher. And all it will take is some sort of incident or moment, something that the market doesn't expect, and you could get a tidal wave of computerized selling that could trigger into a momentum and a, a shift lower and trigger a whole wave of selling and cause stocks to drop a lot. Because when you have an over-concentration in passive indices and you get a wave of selling, well, go back and look what happened in March 2020. Remember, 1% of passive sold, 30% drawdown. So that's what the banks are trying to warn you. Say, hey, you know, unless you've got something in your portfolio that's going to hedge your strategy or you're, or you're doing something uh, along those lines, be careful. It doesn't mean stocks can't keep going higher. It just means you may want to start heeding some of these warnings. Let's take a look at the, let's go through them because, because some of these are pretty dire. Morgan Stanley says the U.S. consumer is headed for a double dip recession. And wow, that's kind of a bold call from Morgan Stanley here. And they're saying that there is a sudden negative change taking place in the economy. And this one is an article that the pitchers say, pretty much a thousand words and they reference the University of Michigan. We've seen this chart before, bad buying conditions for homes, durable goods and vehicles, homes being in red, durables uh, being in blue and vehicles being in orange. And you have multi-decade highs where consumers are saying, look, it's not a good time. And, and how, what does that mean? What does not a good time mean? Either prices are too high or my income isn't going up enough to afford those higher prices that I think I can afford, or I can't get a loan to buy these things, even though I think the prices might go higher. So this means things are bad. Now, what's interesting is the following couple charts that Morgan Stanley submits with their piece. Exhibit number five, consumer sentiment is double dipping. And will the economy slow more than expect, expected there? And again, coming back to the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey, you can see in expansions, the gray area being recessions, that consumers are more confident in that it's a given. You go from losing your job and losing your house and losing a bunch of stuff to making more money and having more opportunity. Well, yeah, you feel good about things. And then a recession hits. And you can see here in the 2000s, it was pretty flat. And in the great financial crisis, we get this boom here. Uh, we have what is probably the shortest recession in history, uh, according to uh, the National Bureau of Economic... Um, I forget what the R is. I don't think it's recession. It could be recession. Anyways, you would get another rally of consumer confidence, and now it's plummeting again. And all that suggests is when it says heads down that we actually are in a recession. Now, what does that mean? Well, we have to go to exhibit six and that says market cap weighted discretionary. So that would be some of your big cap discretionary indices look vulnerable. So you see S&P 500 consumer discretionary versus staples. What are staples? Those are the things that you need 
all the time that you can't live without discretionary being the stuff that you can look uh, live without looks vulnerable absolute and relative to staples saying that look when consumer sentiment goes down people spend less money on discretionary goods and services now we've talked about this a lot as something that is going to happen and we're already seeing some early signs in the retail sales data and with the extended unemployment benefits going away we know at least some, some people are going to have $1,200 a month less to spend, and that will have an impact. Let's go to exhibit 10 that Morgan Stanley sends in their article. It says 10-year U.S. Treasury yields. Whoa, wait a minute. We need to get out the crown and cyclical divided by defensive stock ratio very much in sync. Well, what that means is if we could overlay this chart, this consumer sentiment chart here, and what we would see that during expansions, and when consumers are confident, yields tend to go up and then they go down when they're not as confident. Why would that make sense? I want you to think about that for a second. Why does that make sense? Because when your wages are rising, when you're more confident, what do you do? You borrow money and there's a demand to borrow money and that drives yield higher. So what we're seeing here, despite what the market has been telling us for the last few days of let's jam yields back up. Well, according to Morgan Stanley, well, they're according to their cyclical divide by defensive stock ratio, yields are indeed heading the right direction. Well, what's the conclusion that Morgan Stanley comes to? Well, let's go all the way down to the bottom. And we see if that they say, if the Fed were to talk more aggressively about tapering, which we'll talk about on Friday's show, Wilson thinks it would lead to lower yields in the near term as a bond market may view as a as a mistake as growth is decelerating and the consumer is fading. So what they're, what he's saying is, look, there could be a policy mistake here that drives yields even lower. Now let's head over to Rabobank. Again, not to be outdone by Bank of America and Morgan Stanley. They say, welcome to the mismatch economy. And the implications are huge. And he says, a scan of the latest news stories clearly rams home message that mismatches or imbalances are all but ubiquitous. Now, what does that mean? What are they trying, what is Rabobank trying to suggest here? Well, they're saying things are not quite in line. One of those problems they, they point out is there's too much cash in the system. Well, we already know that. And what do we, what do we sense at by that problem is the reverse repos, which allow institutions to deposit funds overnight at the Fed are supposed to, this is great, supposed to provide a floor on short-term rates. Now, what is the problem with that? Well, if we look over here, and I don't have the four and eight week bill, no uh, yields, but I know they're lower, is you see one month treasury yields are at 0 0.0329 or 3.29 basis points, and the overnight reverse repo rates at five. So despite the Fed attempting to put a floor in, you have one month and shorter uh, bill yield below the overnight repo rate and three and six months are just slightly above it. It's showing that the Fed's policies are not being effective. And if we go back up here, the expectation now, as Robert Bank believes, is the Fed chair will not use the upcoming Jackson Hole meeting as an opportunity to pre-announce a taper of his asset purchase programs. There's, these expectations are taking place I guess a backdrop of a strong rebound in company revenues and earnings. Well, the companies maybe, but the economy not so much. What what do they kind of suggest is the problem? There's such distortions, of course, could be another recipe for policy error. So what Robo Bank is trying to tell you is, look, we don't see a lot of problems. What we see is the Fed could make a policy mistake and that could have damaging effects on the economy if they were to start tapering too soon or not taper soon enough, whatever the, whatever the issue is at hand. And they're not saying they know what it is. They're just saying that the Fed could make a mistake here. Now let's head over to Nomura. Again, you know, we have four banks, B of A coming back to the table to issue warnings to you to say, hey, be careful with your risk. And Nomura warned stocks face extreme de-risking de flow overhang after the last few days. And the last three days of the stock market have been somewhat of I don't even know how to say it, farcical? As stocks have exploded higher, dominated by action at the cash market open, while bonds have refused to follow suit. Now, this is an important concept that we've talked about in the past that you see stock prices rise and yields are not rising. Now, in an expansion, 
What you want to see is stocks rising and yields rising. And what are those yields telling you? That the economy is expanding, that there is money being created, that there is a demand and lending growth is occurring. When you don't get that, what it tells you is that stocks can only go up so much before they start to mean revert down to yields because yields are telling the market the truth. The stocks are out there going crazy, having a party, and the bond market saying, hey, I don't know what you're doing over there, but keep in mind, the financial conditions aren't as great as you think. There isn't the lending growth. There isn't the inflation that you're seeing, perhaps, in some of the data. Let's see what Alice Nomura says, that the reason it's driving the stocks lately is not just buying because of fundamentals, because people are targeting the more, most shorted stocks, and that is help making some sharp moves higher in the equity markets. Now let's go back to B of A, who, again, not to be outdone, on Monday comes back, come back on Wednesday and says, look, investors have begun to reduce leverage. A bear, B of A spots a bearish signal in margin debt. Now what is, what is this all about? So we have Bank of America, Stephen Sutemeyer has spotted potentially a bearish peak for margin debt in June 2021. And quote, rising leverage tends to confirm U.S. equity rallies. It is, no, it is not new record highs for margin debt that we worry about. We get concerned when margin debt stops rising to suggest that investors have begun to reduce leverage. Now, what is margin debt? For those of you who don't know, that is when you open your account and you borrow money against your stocks to go buy more stocks. And people often look at market rallies and say, wow, they're, they're going on fundamentals. They're going because uh, they're rising because of the, the good signs in the economy and profits. No, they're rising on debt. People are borrowing money and buying stocks and they're doing it at a record level. So check this out. Here's chart one, S&P 500 versus FINRA margin debt on a monthly. Going back all the way to 1997, you can see margin debt here in red rising, bringing stocks up. So people, people are borrowing money they don't have to buy stocks they don't own and hoping that other people come along and buy after them at a higher price. That's the whole idea. It's like flipping a home. You buy a home, maybe you fix it up, maybe you just directly flip it, hoping someone will pay more. And then you can see as margin debt heads down, stocks head down in black, and you see them go up together, down together, up together, down together, and new all-time highs sitting way up here, but it stopped potentially in June of 2021. And they go on to say chart number two, the same chart is on the top, but now we're looking at 12-month rate of change in margin debt at the bottom. So this is pretty cool. This is this 12-month rate of change, you can see peaks correlate as I drew this dotted red line with peaks in margin debt and peaks in margin debt tend to kind of they they tend not lag but they tend to come before a peak in the equity market so you see peak in margin debt you know the stocks peak just after that peak in margin debt almost at the same time peak in margin debt and now you see B of A is saying hey look this is a problem here. You should be paying attention. Now they went on and did a Z-score in chart three, and this is cool. The 12-month Z-score for Fender margin debt is a rolling over after hitting overbought extremes above plus two in August and December of 2020. This drop in the 12-month Z-score resembles those seen at peaks in margin debt from May of 18, again, warning, April of 11, July of 07, March of 00, which saw deeper corrections for the SPX or S&P 500 in late 2018, mid to late 2011. Again, see, it, it, this kind of precedes a decline in stock prices from late 2007, early 2009, early 2000, and mid late 02 and here you can see here august and december 2020 starting to peak and come down they're saying you want to buy this when it's at a low and you want to start looking at getting out now here you see in august but they're really concerned about it dropping below this zero line here so that is kind of the red flag zone is as this continues to fall so again b of a putting out the warning and here you can see the net free credit versus the end the s p 500 on a monthly chart free credit balances of net margin debt moved to a record negative levels of minus 433 billion in July if net free credit begins to rise. So what is net free credit? That means you're available, available money to borrow. It could send a bearish signal from US equities. And here you can see it is at all time lows. And if that starts to reverse, if people start closing out their positions and increasing their availability credit, well, that tends to signify a peak in the market. All right, let's talk about something really important that's going on because there's all this talk about 
that the treasury is going to tighten financial conditions. Now we talked about this in a prior show where as soon as the debt ceiling is lifted or some sort of deal is made, that the treasury is going to come out and borrow a bunch of money because they need it. In the meantime, they're drawing this thing down and they're hoping not to get to zero. And what you're hearing from people say is, ah, it's a form of quantitative tightening. Let me show you what people are saying. Here it is. Forget the Fed and Jackson Hole. The treasury is about to unleash 500 billion of quantitative tightening. Now, is that really true or not? Well, here's the problem. It is not true at all. It is not a form of quantitative tightening. Can it be a, let's be specific. Can it be a form of tightening? Yes. Can it be quantitative tightening? No. So when, when does the treasury or when, is, when the treasury borrows, when is it considered tightening? Well, if there isn't a lot of cash out in the financial system and the treasury goes and borrows a bunch, well, it tightens financial conditions. But what is our problem right now? We have too much cash. So if the treasury comes out and borrows, say, 500 billion, is it going to lead to tightening? It shouldn't. It shouldn't at all. In fact, it should provide some, some of that pristine collateral, those T-bills that the financial system desperately needs. Now, how do we know it's not quantitative tightening? That's the big question on the table is how, does, how do I know? How will you know? Well, it's simple. Because when the Fed does quantitative easing, they create a reserve asset, swap it with the commercial banks, and that is held on the bank balance sheet at a Federal Reserve member bank, that reserve asset. Now, the question is, when the Treasury borrows, does it undo that process? And the answer is it does not. Only the Fed has the authority to do quantitative tightening. So given all the cash in the financial system, is an, uh, all this borrowing, this projected 500 billion, maybe more by the time the, uh, the debt ceiling is raised, is it going to really tighten financial conditions? And I'll say probably not again due to all the cash in the system. Let's take a look at some economic data as we try to find if there are signs of a slowing economy. New home sales rose 1%. And let's take a look at this chart uh, from Zero Hedge as well. Uh, US, new one family home sold one, up 1%. But look at this year over year basis, bam, minus 27%. So remember, we've seen some of this indication here where bad buying condition for homes is going to lead to lower housing prices and lower demand. So you start to see some of that there. How about we head over to the Richmond Fed to take a look at the manufacturing index, which slowed from 27 to 9. What's going on over there with Richmond Fed? Now, remember, each index equals a percentage of firms responding firms reporting an increase minus of firms reporting a decrease. So 9% of firms and said current conditions improved. That's down from 27. That's, that's a big drop. Shipments, only 6% of firms saying an increase. Volume of orders, only 5% of firms. Backlog of orders, only 9%. Notice how this is massively slow in capacity utilization. Only 6% of firms said there's an increase. Vendor lead time. Everybody's got a problem there. 61% of firms saying that. But look at this. Local business conditions, boom, a negative. So you see more firms said local business conditions. 12% of firms said business conditions got worse. Capital expenditures slow. Finished good inventories were down. Raw material inventories down. Equipment and software spending, 16% of firms. Obviously automating because, well, they can't get the labor they want. Uh, how about employment? 18% of firms uh, seeing an increase, so that number's down. 50% of firms about the same or increasing wages, maybe a little more over the month before uh, and back in, what do we have here, June? And then how about this average work week? That's pretty consistent, 11% of firms saying uh, the work week increased. But look, at, how about this? Prices paid year over year up 11%. So it's starting to flatten out. But look at this, prices received. They're pushing prices through. That's pretty impressive. So consumers, think of this, consumers are, start, are going to soon get hit with a price increase at a time when all of these unemployment benefits are going away. How about the services side of the Richmond Fed? Uh, what do we see? 15% uh, of firms showing increase in revenue, 25% saying demand is increasing. So those are pretty decent numbers. 11% uh, saying local business conditions are improving. That is slowing down. 19% uh, increase in capital expenditures, so a slightly higher. Software and equipment spending up 23%. Again, automating jobs because people aren't at work. Services expenditures, only 9%. Slowing trend there. Number of employees, 17% of firms increasing. Wages, it looks like consistently around 40% uh, of firms are continuing to increase wages. 
Uh, the uh, average work week, 15% of firms range, but how about this? Prices paid, still up a little bit. Now, if we went from five to six to seven, prices received, you know, low threes, mid threes, boom, up to four. So we're, again, starting to see some of these price increases get pushed to consumers at a time when they can't really afford it. We had two-year note auction was met with pretty strong demand. Despite that, investors continued to sell bonds ahead of the Jackson Hole meeting. Uh, today, we had mortgage applications up 1.6%. So what does that tell you about demand for mortgages and demand at higher yield? It tells you that, you, that de there isn't that much demand. In an inflationary environment, when yields rise, it's because you want to see demand for lending. If you see your yields rise and there's no, there's not an increase in lending demand, then those higher yields get rejected. It's, it's simple supply and demand dynamics. Who is driving yields higher right now? Well, it's speculators believing that there is all this inflation and there is all this money that's going to translate into more borrowing, and we're just not seeing it at all. Uh, as we move on in today's data, we have the durable goods new orders down 1.01% in July, taking a look at this chart here, still running at 16.7% from this time uh, last year, but the trend is rapidly slowing down on that. Uh, core durable goods, so take out food and energy. So food and energy prices must have gone down because the core went up 0.7. So perhaps some good news for consumers that durable goods that have you know food and energy are indeed Prices are going down. And then we have, of course, last but not least, well, actually, we got the five year note option too. We got crude oil inventories, uh, gasoline inventories, distillate inventories below their averages for where they should be this time of the year. Again, kind of a bullish backdrop for crude prices. And then we had a five year note auction, which actually was pretty well received by foreign investors, uh, but the tail or the yield that it closed out uh, was a little bit higher than expected and caused a further decline in bond prices or a little bit higher in yields today with the 30 year tagging. It's uh, 50 day moving average here. Let me show you this real quick. Let's take a look at this because what could be a very tactical move is you see 30 year treasury is coming up tagging the 15 day moving average getting rejected obviously it's still at this point confirming the downward trend i don't think speculators are done uh, but i'm sure they'll give it another go either tonight or tomorrow uh, they seem to be pretty convinced that yields need to go higher anyways thanks for watching thanks for being fans we'll see you back on friday where we'll find out what really happened at jackson hole even though the fed actually isn't going there because it's a virtual meeting. We'll see, do they taper, do they not? My guess is they don't. We'll see you then, bye now. The content of this video is provides educational information only is not intended by investors or other rights materials not to be construed as recognition or solicitation by our state security, financial instrument, or participating in a particular training strategy. Serial is paired by Steam Van Meter or Prince Capacity. Business expressed this video do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advice Inc. or Steam Van Meter Financial.